Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jim Lockler. I'm Director of Conservation at Lauritsen Gardens in Omaha. And the title of my talk is More Than a Pretty Place. I'm going to be talking about uh, 10 years of conservation work at Lauritsen Gardens. Before I launch into the specifics of conservation, I do want to let you realize or let you know that Lauritsen Gardens really is a pretty place. If you haven't been there, it's, uh, uh, it's 100 acres uh, tucked into the riverfront hills of Omaha. And we have about 25 different garden spaces within the 100 acres. And as you can imagine, it, uh, uh, every season is attractive there. Spring is beautiful with the, with the tulips and other bulbs. Summer, we have lots of annuals planted in the, in the gardens. Fall is, is an especially beautiful time with fall color and, and lots of fall blooming things. Even winter is a nice time to visit. We have some things that bloom in winter like witch hazel. It's a nice time just to be in the quiet of the garden with the snow on the ground. And winter is a nice time to visit our conservatory, uh, 17,000 square feet under glass, tropicals from all over the world. So it's a great place on a really, really cold day. It's 80 degrees and 80% humidity. So it's, it's a wonderful place to be on a cold February day. And it's packed with very lush tropical vegetation, which we light up in the holiday season. And so it's, it's just kind of crazy, spectacular with color. So uh, Lawrence and Gardens is a fun place, a beautiful place to visit all four seasons. The thing that sets a botanic garden apart from just a really nice landscape or a park is that it's a collection based enterprise. And so like a museum, we have a, a living collection of plants. So we have a peony collection, we have a hosta and Asian maple collection. We even have a magnolia collection. So we grow plants from all over the country, all over the world if possible. Uh, this is probably the weirdest plant we've ever grown. It's called a, a giant uh, Titan Arum. And it's also called a voodoo lily. It emits a horrible smell when it blooms. And uh, this is a plant that's native to Sumatra. It's very rare in cultivation. We, and they, just, they bloom when they want to. And when they do, everything gets on standby and hold And because uh, people love to see weird stuff. So we're not beyond or above putting out weird exotic plants to get people into the garden. This is our director of horticulture taking a whiff of this plant, which smells like rotting flesh. So 10-year-old uh, uh, boys love it, it's, it's a lot of fun. So although we grow things from all over the world, we are very uh, concerned about our place on the planet. And there's a definite Midwest sense of place when you come to the garden. This is an aerial view, it's, it's dated, but you can see the uh, parking lot down in the lower center part and then the garden extends up into kind of the middle of this picture. We're just five minutes from the, uh, the old market and downtown Omaha. So, very urbanized setting, uh, but we're also located on the Missouri River and, we, and we're the only botanic garden, as far as I'm aware of, that's located uh, along the, the entire extent of the Missouri River, which is the third largest river on the planet. So we take our location and our sense of place very seriously. When you arrive at the garden, uh, you'll immediately be immersed in a typical Midwest landscape with Baroque, uh, our, our parking garden area, we have water with uh, native plants in it. We have uh, warm season grasses planted as, as buffers. So we're very, very much a Midwest sense of place. Our conservation program grows out of this sense of place. And I'm gonna be talking about five different aspects of this program, but our overall our aim is conserving plants and the biodiversity they support. So I'll be going through each one of these five points. Uh, one of the ways we hope to contribute to conservation is by conducting conservation ass assessments of plant species that are at risk of extinction, either globally or maybe on a more localized basis. The state of Nebraska has uh, uh, identified biologically unique landscapes that are high priority conservation areas, primarily because of the number of at risk species or, or communities associated with those areas. So we've done studies of uh, rare plants uh, associated with two different of these uh, BULs in Nebraska, the Kimball grasslands, uh, which is out in the very far western part of the, the uh, southwest corner of the Panhandle. And we did a, a rare plant survey of 10 different species that are associated with this unique grass. And here's a, uh, one of them, moss phlox, which is not globally rare, but it is a, a Nebraska tier two at risk species. So this work involves uh, trying to uh, return to places where these plants have been found historically, working with the Bessie herbarium at the University of Nebraska. Uh, locating those plants, seeing if they're still there, what their conservation issues are, uh, trying to understand the ecology of these plants a little bit better. We've also done a rare plant survey in the Sand Sage Prairie region, a BUL of Nebraska, and again, focusing on, in this case, I think it was about 14 different 
at-risk feces that the uh, Nebraska Natural Legacy Project has identified as, as high priority at-risk species associated with this uh, plant community and landscape. One of these is uh, sand sage prairie clover, which we uh, have been studying and, and looking for out in that area. In both cases, uh, when we completed these projects, we prepared a report for the uh, Nebraska Natural Legacy Project that summarizes our findings, our assessment of these species and uh, their, their current status. One of the plants we followed up on a little bit further outside of these areas is sand sage prairie clover. It's been an interesting plant to work with. Uh, originally thought to be only associated with sand sage prairie. We, had, we encountered in 2014 a couple of occurrences right on the edge of the sand hills and noticed that they were associated with a kind of transitory habitat between sand dune and uh, more, more uh, uh, clay loam textured soils. And so we started looking all around the perimeter of the sand hills and found a whole bunch more uh, populations of this plant. So, so this kind of field work helps us understand these plants a little bit better and their, their uh, ecology and conservation needs. Uh, another thing we're trying to do is, is support ecosystem scale conservation in Nebraska and the Great Plains. So the, the uh, central grassland of North America, tall grass, mixed grass, short grass, prairie is a huge area. And there's still lots of work to be done in terms of floristics and ecology. We're trying to support that by doing some research in this area. One of our projects has been to identify all the endemic plants that occur across these three grasslands. In, uh, uh, and so in that work, uh, a lot of interesting results from that. I think over 300 different endemic plants were identified. One of the things we notice is that there are concentrations of endemics, uh, kind of hot spots within the Great Plains. And people were aware of this in the Southern Great Plains, but, but we found that there is actually a, a hot spot of endemic plants in the, uh, in the Nebraska Panhandle, an area we call the Niobrara Platte Tableland. So trying to understand uh, the concentration distribution of rare plants and, and again, some of the issues they face. We've also, uh, we started studying sand sage prairie in Nebraska but we've carried that beyond the state boundaries. As we were looking at sand sage prairie and the at-risk plants there, we began to recognize that sand sage prairie is not a monolithic plant community. It varies considerably within, uh, within an occurrence. And to understand the ecology and the conservation needs of these plants, we need to do a broader study. So we did kind of a reverse Coronado expedition. Uh, instead of coming south to north, we went from north to south and looked at sand sage prairie in Kansas, Colorado, Texas and New Mexico, and identified some big picture issues. We delineated the actual distribution of sand sage prairie in the Great Plains. That's all the areas in black there on the map to your left. Identified plants and animals of conservation concern that are associated with this plant community and some of the other biodiversity attributes of it. This work has resulted in a series of publications. It started with the Rare Plant Survey in Nebraska expanded to a, a ecosystem-wide survey of the plants and plant community ecology. And then in a paper that's coming out in January, uh, we'll be uh, talking about that this plant, this ecological system is actually a biodiversity hotspot for the Great Plains. So just trying to understand, add to the understanding of the ecology of this, uh, this region, which needs to be better known. Well, because we're gardeners and horticulturists and we can't help ourselves, we collect seed and, and grow plants. This is actually sand sage prairie clover, some seedlings we've grown. That leads me into another aspect of our conservation work, and this is seed banking, establishing seed banks and gene banks of at-risk species. Seed banking involves the collecting samples of seed from wild populations according to scientifically developed protocols, storing it under conditions that in turn uh, ensure long-term viability. This has been done for a long time by some of the bigger botanic gardens in the world, Q, uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens Q in England has been doing this for some time. We are part of a national network of gardens that are engaged in seed banking projects within their particular regions. It's called the Center for Plant Conservation. The, the aim is to create a national seed bank of America's imperiled plants. These are some of the plants that we worked with in, our, in the last few years here in the Great Plains. I'll, I'll highlight a, uh, just a, a handful of these for you. Blowout penstemon is a very familiar plant to folks in Nebraska, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service endangered species, Nebraska tier one at-risk species. About 10 or 12 clusters of populations uh, found in the sand hills occurring in blowouts. And uh, last uh, two years ago, we were able to uh, uh, get a good collection, a good sampling of seed from some blowouts in uh, Garden County, Nebraska. And that involves, again, going returning to historic sites where the plants have been known to occur and collecting seed. 
Some of that seed has been used for a restoration project on an on undisclosed location on a ranch in the Sand Hills. We also send some of the seed to the USDA uh, National Laboratory for Genetic Resources Preservation. They have state-of-the-art uh, storage, uh, seed storage uh, equipment there. So doing that, another plant we worked with just this year, Bars Milk Vetch, a Nebraska tier one at-risk species, a, a little low growing mound forming plant that grows in very rocky habitat in the north and uh, northwest Great Plains. There's only one occurrence known in Nebraska on this butte uh, in Dawes County. We went out there in July and collected seed and, and uh, uh, so you can see it's very tiny. It's very laborious work, but, uh, but we got the timing right. So that was good. This is an inter interesting project, Colorado butterfly plant that is now extinct in Nebraska. As far as we know, it, it occurred historically in Kimball County, collected seed of this plant in 1986 uh, and uh, actually germinated some seed recently. So the only plants of this uh, uh, Nebraska seed source are in, uh, in the garden here in Omaha. This is a, a more recent project involving a, an endangered tree called butternut. It's a relative of walnut that was recently discovered. Well, it's been going uh, extinct throughout its range in the Eastern US because of a, a canker disease. But a population was discovered by this guy, John Morganson with the Game and Parks Commission and his brother, Greg, in uh, South of Nebraska City in 2016. We collected seed last year and we have about 200 seedlings growing of this that we'll be planting here at the garden. We distributed through the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum for conservation plantings as well. So those are some things that, that happen in greater Nebraska and throughout the Great Plains. But we're also doing some work here at the garden. We're trying to practice ecological stewardship of the 100 acre property. We have about 10 acres of Oak Hickory Forest or woodland that we're trying to restore and manage. We've collected uh, seed off of our native stand of bur oak. We planted about 300 bur oak from our uh, local genotype back into the garden in various areas. And uh, uh, this is an area where we planted, I think, 2015. And for the first time this year, we uh, actually had acorns on these trees. So they're growing, some of them are already eight feet tall. So that's been exciting, a little bit of woodland restoration. We're also just trying to understand the biology of the place a little bit better. So we're doing biological survey, birds, butterflies, and bees, uh, 155 species of birds over, uh, I think, 23 different warblers. Uh, we're, we started mothing last year. We didn't do it this year, but uh, about 100 different species of moths just getting started on this. One of the things this does is it informs our horticultural practice here at the garden. So we, uh, it, it points out to us certain areas that are hot spots even within the garden of biodiversity, and that, that uh, influences how we manage those areas. Believe it or not, uh, one of the areas of highest biodiversity, birds, butterflies, and bees in the garden is in our parking lot because there's such a diversity of habitat there. We're also experimenting with uh, different management techniques. We have had goats in the garden. They do eat uh, crown vetch and Siberian elm, which is good, but uh, you'd have to have them here every year. So that was a fun experiment, but we're not <laughs> repeating that. We have a lot of area planted to warm season grasses. It's more manageable in terms of water conservation. Uh, and in the past, we've always basically hayed that and mowed that. Uh, but this year we, we uh, trained, some of our horticulture staff were trained and certified in burning and we're actually conducting controlled burns within the 100 acres, which has been, you can see the big smile on their face. They're not having to cut and haul that stuff off. Finally, the other aspect of our program is just trying to inspire a conservation ethic in the people that visit the garden. We have uh, uh, over 250,000 folks that come to the garden each year. So there's a lot of opportunity to weave conservation messaging into their visit. We have a, what's called the Conservation Discovery Garden that opened in 2015 with a lot of signage about use of native plants and water conserving practices. We actually have done some uh, uh, messaging through our programming about conservation, in this case, uh, recycling plastics. We had two artists who specialize in creating works of art from recycled plastics, which are beautiful and kind of awful at the same time. You can see the plastic forks and spoons and spatulas, tied bottle caps that are woven into these things. And then we also had on display some bales of uh, crushed plastic from the uh, local Nebraska Omaha recycler, just to give folks a little bit of a, a connection to uh, this whole process. We're also trying to just help people appreciate where they are uh, a little bit better. And so we helped bring this wonderful book on wildflowers of the plains back into print. It's been out of print for a number of years. A lot of the nomenclature was out of date. So we helped bring a, a revised edition of this back into print. Uh, conservation, frankly, 
Pardon me, three minutes? Three minutes. All right, thank you. To be honest, conservation was not a part of the original vision of Lauritz and Gardens, um, but it's something that's, that's really part of the fabric of the place anyway, even if it was unspoken. This is a view uh, from our conservation discovery garden, looking east into the Missouri River Valley and in, back into the garden. And if you'd been standing at this site in the 1970s, this is what you would have seen. Uh, we don't usually uh, brag about this, but Lauritz and Gardens started as a landfill. It was a, a, a landfill city of Omaha that uh, was capped and you can't build anything on it. And so somebody had the crazy idea of starting a garden here. So that's our origins, reclaiming, repurposing, uh, all those wonderful uh, re revisiting things that happen on a landscape. So now you see this, this beautiful garden that's developed and we're actually starting to burn this thing too. So uh, beautiful plants and gardens from all over the world, but also definitely uh, uh, looking at where we are and trying to manage with uh, ecological sustainability in mind. We've worked with lots of, continued work with lots of different partners. I've highlighted the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project, which has funded some of our research. And we've been excited to work with a whole array of, of public and private partners in accomplishing this work. So thank you very much for, for an opportunity to just uh, kind of scan the highlights here.